The world knows Israel as a desert nation, over 60% sand and rock, far from any abundant river. Yet today, water flows across the Negev, pumped uphill from a lake that lies 213 meters below sea level. The water moves through a man-made artery that cost $4 billion, an engineering project that, by all logic, should not exist. Why would a young country gamble its very survival on building an impossible river? The answer reveals how desperation rewrote the rules of engineering and what that means for every nation running dry. Water has always been the defining limit here. Israel sits on the edge of the Negev, a desert that covers more than half the country. About 60% of the land is arid or semi-arid, with rainfall so scarce that the ground cracks and the air shimmers with heat. When the country declared independence in 1948, it inherited not just a patch of land, but a geography of thirst. The only major sources of fresh water, the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee, and a handful of underground aquifers were already stretched thin. Then came a wave of new arrivals. In the years after statehood, hundreds of thousands of immigrants poured into Israel, doubling the population in less than a decade. Holocaust survivors and refugees from across the Middle East and North Africa were all seeking safety and all needing water. The math was brutal. There simply wasn't enough to go around. Planners and politicians warned that without a radical solution, the dream of a thriving nation in the desert could collapse. Water wasn't just a resource, it was a matter of survival. Every new well, every drop counted. In the face of relentless demand and a hostile climate, the search for water became a national obsession, pushing leaders and engineers to consider ideas that bordered on the impossible. In 1958, Israel committed to a project so bold, it bordered on the unreal, the National Water Carrier. The plan called for a man-made artery stretching 130 kilometers from the Sea of Galilee to the parched heart of the country. But this was no gentle river winding downhill. The Sea of Galilee sits more than 200 meters below sea level, while the Negev and the central plains rise far above it. Moving water south meant fighting gravity every step of the way. Engineers at Mekarot, the National Water Company, designed a system that would lift millions of cubic meters of water 250 meters straight up from the lake. The heart of the operation was the Saper Pumping Station, a fortress of steel and concrete built to muscle water out of the basin and into a network of pipes, open canals, and tunnels. One of those tunnels, carved through 850 meters of stubborn limestone at Ilut, became a symbol of the project's ambition. Every segment was a lesson in scale. Pressure pipelines stretching for kilometers open canals wide enough to swallow a convoy of trucks and reservoirs shaped to minimize evaporation under a relentless sun. The financial gamble was staggering. At the time, the carrier's price tag, about $420 million, represented a huge share of the young nation's economy. Adjusted for today, it comes to roughly $4 billion. Thousands of workers spent eight years carving, welding, and pouring concrete under the desert sun, often with little more than hope and blueprints. With every meter built, Israel was betting its future on the idea that technology and determination could outmatch climate and geography. The carrier wasn't just infrastructure. It was a national lifeline, engineered against the odds. Every drop that traveled the length of the national water carrier was a victory against the desert, but it was also a reminder of just how fragile the system remained. 
operators at Mikorot watched their control panels with a kind of nervous reverence, knowing that the carrier's flow was chained to the moods of the sky hundreds of kilometers away. The Sea of Galilee, source of Israel's man-made river, rose and fell with each winter's rain, or lack of it. In wet years, the lake brimmed with promise. In dry years, its shoreline crept backward, exposing cracked mud and old boat ramps left stranded far from the water's edge. The carrier could only move what nature provided. Its entire operation was governed by a seasonal lottery. Too little rainfall in the north meant the pumps would run dry, no matter how advanced the engineering. Every year, utility engineers calculated the lake's inflow with grim precision. If the water level dropped below the so-called lower red line, the rules demanded emergency restrictions and the threat of, of ecological damage loomed. Operators learned to read the warning signs, the subtle shift in the lake's color as salinity crept up. The anxious bulletins issued after a disappointing winter. The system's dependence on a single, volatile reservoir made it vulnerable to forces no one could control. The carrier, for all its scale and ambition, was only as strong as the next rainy season. One prolonged drought, and the entire country would be back on the edge of crisis, watching the gauges fall and wondering if this miracle river could hold out another year. Rainfall grew weaker, year after year. By the late 1990s, Israel was entering what officials would call the Black Drought. From 1998 to 2002, the Sea of Galilee, Israel's main reservoir, sank to its lowest levels in living memory. The water dropped past the lower red line, the official warning threshold, and hovered just above the black line, a point hydrologists described as the edge of ecological collapse. Each winter brought anxious updates from the Water Commission. The lake's surface receded, exposing mud flats and salt crusts where water once shimmered. Aquifers along the coast and in the hills were tapped to their limits. Wells ran dry in outlying villages. Fields lay fallow. Inside government ministries, crisis teams met behind closed doors. The numbers were grim. In 1999, the Sea of Galilee fell below minus 213 meters, then slipped even lower. By 2001, it was only about one meter above the black line, a depth that, if breached, threatened irreversible damage to the lake and the entire water system. Emergency measures were rolled out. Municipalities rationed water. Farmers faced severe cutbacks. The national water carrier, once a symbol of triumph, now looked like a lifeline fraying at both ends. Conservation campaigns and wastewater recycling bought some time, but the math was punishing. Even the most drastic restrictions could not summon rain. Each year of drought deepened the deficit. The country was forced to confront an unthinkable reality. The old sources were failing, and the next dry spell could tip the system past recovery. The only option left was to look beyond the land itself, to the Mediterranean and the promise of water pulled from the sea. Ashkelon changed everything. When the plant went online in 2005, it was one of the largest seawater desalination facilities on Earth, designed to produce nearly 330,000 cubic meters of fresh water every day. The heart of its breakthrough was the pressure center design a radical layout that slashed the number of high-pressure pumps needed and squeezed more efficiency from every watt. IDE Technologies, the Israeli engineers behind the plant, pushed energy recovery to new heights 
making desalinated water cheaper than ever before. But the real leap came with SORIC, completed in 2013. SORIC's vertical 16-inch membrane modules towered over the factory floor, packing more surface area into less space and driving output to about 400,000 cubic meters every day. For the first time, a single plant could supply drinking water to over a million people. These mega plants did not just keep pace with demand, they tipped the balance. Desalination was no longer a last resort. It became the backbone of a national supply and the world started to take notice. Rows of cherry tomatoes, bell peppers, and even grapes now stretch across land that once seemed hopeless for farming. The secret is not just water, it is how that water is delivered. In the 1960s, Simcha Blass and the team at Kibbutz Hatsarim developed drip irrigation, a method that delivers precise drops of water straight to the roots. Drip irrigation slashed waste, boosted yields, and made it possible to grow export quality crops in the Negev's harsh climate. Natafim, founded in 1965, turned this local breakthrough into a global business. Today, more than 130 Israeli companies design water tech. Everything from smart irrigation to leak detection, supplying solutions to farmers and cities worldwide. Delegations from India, California, and Africa arrive to study these methods, hoping to replicate the desert's transformation. Exports of technology and know-how now rival the crops themselves. In the Negev, orchards and greenhouses stand as proof that scarcity can be turned into abundance and that water innovation is Israel's most valuable export. As global drought intensifies, over 2 billion people face water scarcity right now. Israel's leap from desert to surplus proves that technology can rewrite destinies, but only if we act before crisis hits. The next water revolution will not wait for permission. Will we? Share your thoughts below.